Hey, good morning and welcome to uh, Sunday Celebration Online. Thanks for just checking in with us. Stick with me on this message, but we've got several messages that are coming up. And we're going to be talking about living upside down. We're heading to an important part of the scriptures, the Sermon on the Mount. So before we go any further, uh, let's go ahead. Just bow your hearts. Let's pray. Gracious God, we call to you. These words that Jesus uttered are life-changing, and we ask, Father, that we would open up to you right now and allow your Spirit to come and fashion us in uh, the very course of these words. Fashion us in, uh, in the will, um, your will, O God, that we might live out these words of Jesus. So open up our hearts, our minds, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in the Sermon on the Mount. It's called that because uh, what you'll find is there's a context that Jesus went to. Throughout all of church history, uh, over these last 2,000 years, there has been much attention that's been given to uh, the Sermon on the Mount. After 1,900 years, A.M. Hunter says, the Sermon on the Mount still haunts men. Now, they may praise it as Mahatma Gandhi did, or like Nietzsche, they may curse it. They cannot ignore it. Its words are winged words, quick and powerful to rebuke, to challenge, to inspire. There is little doubt that men would account it the most searching and powerful utterance we possess on what concerns the moral life. Uh, those are, that's a real powerful statement by Hunter. There are many that look at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7, and many who look at it and just say, hey, listen, this bar is set way too high. There is no way possible for us to live this out. In fact, the truth is, as I've moved through this passage before and had conversations with individuals, they would want to, in many ways, discount the very thoughts of Jesus and the words of Jesus as this is, this is just not humanly possible uh, for us. Uh, but uh, the Didache which is an early writing of, of early Christians, most dated somewhere from 600 to 80, not 660 to 80 AD. So it's within that first generation of followers of Jesus, eyewitnesses would still be there. And written are these words, and by the way, this was written as really kind of a discipleship manual for the followers of Jesus. But uh, these, these are words, Koine Greek, uh, but anyway, written in Koine Greek, but these are the words, see that no one leads you astray from this way of teaching. The idea is these words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. For such a person teaches you without regard for God. For if you are able to bear the whole yoke of the Lord, you will be perfect. In other words, if you can go ahead and follow these words of Jesus and put them into practice, then you're going to be complete in following Jesus. You'll be a complete uh, disciple. But notice the last sentence, but if you are not able, then do what you can. In other words, this is the very best bar for us to go ahead and uh, follow after Jesus. Uh, keeping living this teaching of Jesus is only possible through the dependence uh, on God and His Spirit empowerment. This is what we're going to learn. So over these next few weeks, as we look at Matthew 5, 6, 7, these words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, what you're going to discover is uh, this is difficult. This is not easy. And Jesus isn't asking it to be easy. But what he's saying is, this is what it's like when God has his way. This is what it is like when God's kingdom comes in your life. And he's really going to say, uh, live like this. So, the great theme of these three chapters is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, in Matthew's, he uses this customary expression like, a, like uh, uh, other New Testament writers would maybe call the kingdom of God, but he uses this expression, kingdom of heaven. And by the one way, they're interchangeable. They're both referring to the same thing. It is the rule of God in the hearts and lives of men. But Matthew, like many Jews of his day, would avoid using the very word God. So they felt it was too holy, too exalted. Therefore, euphemisms like heaven were adopted. Uh, but in meaning, the kingdom of heaven is identical to the kingdom of God. 
Now, when we look at this use of kingdom that Jesus uses, he's talking about it in a sense of a dynamic rule and reign of God rather than spatial. So he's not talking about a geographical borders or territory where God will reign. Instead, what he's talking about is uh, that when God has his way within our lives, this expression of kingdom of God actually also applies to the present. Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God is here and now, In fact, as he goes out and preaches, he declares, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And uh, all of the New Testament writers knew that the kingdom really begins and is launched with the coming of Messiah. So it's in the present, but also it is in the future. It was, it is, it is to come. That's what the kingdom of God is. And we will see the fullness in the future of God's rule and reign. But in the meantime, his kingdom is alive and well, and it is powerful and dynamic. Also, what you will find is this idea of the kingdom of God, God's reign that relates directly to his saving purposes. In other words, this is not a universal kingdom. It's not like, well, God is sovereign over all things, and so God has his way. No, the idea is that God has his way when we surrender to him and invite him in to have his way. So it's according to his saving purpose. purposes. All who are in his kingdom have life, and those who are not in his kingdom do not have life. You see, the reign of God in our lives brings the dynamic of God's authority and our wholehearted allegiance or submission to that authority. That constitutes the reign of God and the kingdom of God. In other words, when we understand and submit to the dynamic of his authority in our lives and its wholehearted allegiance to it, then this is what it's like when God has his way within our lives. So this Sermon on the Mount demonstrates the kind of living with regard to character and conduct that should govern the people of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Hey, great preacher and commentator D. Martin Lloyd-Jones has said this, Here is the life to which we are called. I maintain again that if only every Christian in the church today were living the Sermon on the Mount, the great revival for which we are praying and longing could already have started. Amazing and astounding things would happen. The world would be shocked and men and women would be attracted to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. By the way, it's the Sermon on the Mount. And at the close of every day, great revivalist, great man of prayer, Reese Howells. There he is in his younger years and his older years. But uh, the Sermon on the Mount was the measure stick for his life. So when he would lay his head on, on the pillow at night, he would head back through the Sermon on the Mount. And he would look at it one more time and evaluate and ask the question, Did I live like Jesus asked me to go ahead and live? Now, what I want to do is I want to go ahead as this is kind of an introduction and then we're going to head into the blessings, but we're only going to do half the blessings. (laughs) Uh, Good for you, the fact that I have condensed this and put it into two parts because there's a lot of information I long to give you. There's so much richness in these words of Jesus, but I want to first lay out and understand what leads into these words of the Sermon on the Mount. This is Matthew, close of Matthew chapter 4. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Well, think of that sentence. You're going to hear the close of after and following the Sermon on the Mount, and you're going to, you're going to hear these are like parentheses around the teaching. News about Jesus spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. And large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. So here is Jesus, and he's doing amazing things. He is demonstrating uh, outwardly, physically, in real lifetime. This is what the kingdom of God is like as he is preaching and as he is uh, performing miracles and healing the sick. And as this is taking place, crowds are gathering. And that is going to lead to the message where the crowds gather and Jesus pulls his disciples and, uh, and, and gives the Sermon on the Mount. But catch, this is Matthew chapter 9. Following the Sermon on the Mount, you will also find again Jesus going out healing, demonstrating the power of the kingdom of God. But verse 35 in Matthew 9 says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages. 
teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. So Jesus comes and he, and he demonstrates God's authority and then he teaches on God's authority, what it is when, when God is the king over our lives. And then again, he demonstrates that out. So these are like parentheses around this teaching. Jesus has all the authority to teach, but much of this authority comes from what he lives out and demonstrates in uh, the healings, the miracles, the powerful preaching that takes place. Okay, so I want to go ahead and give you these first uh, couple of introductory verses, and then I want to, to, to take you to the last story. We're not going to discuss the last story, but it's important that we understand it. So even as we begin the Sermon on the Mount, we understand where Jesus is going with it. So it starts with these two verses. One day, as he saw the crowds gathering, remember, they're gathering why? Because he is demonstrating the power of the kingdom of God by healing the sick, by casting out demons, by, uh, by performing miracles, powerfully preaching about uh, the good news. And as he does this, uh, the crowds are gathering, and Jesus went up on the mountainside, Matthew writes, and he sat down. By the way, this very idea is, um, first of all, Matthew sees, he's, he's, he's um, writing to Jewish, um, to, to Jewish people. And uh, the, the whole word picture here of the mountainside, he's, he's clearly stating that uh, the Son of God has come, but he is a, a new prophet, and he has greater authority than the Old Testament prophet Moses. And so here he is, and he's on the mountainside, and he's going to teach, and then he sits down. And the idea, that, by the way, this is what rabbis would do. So when you see me sitting down here on a chair or in front of the sanctuary and I'm sitting on that stool, <laughs> I just want to be like Jesus. So you will find the rabbis would do that, but also there's this sense of as, as you're seated. By the way, do you remember in Luke chapter 4 when Jesus uh, uh, read from the scrolls of Isaiah in his hometown synagogue? And he stood and he read... But then when he was finished reading the scrolls, he puts them, he rolls them back up, puts them away, and he sits down and he looks at his, at his uh, neighbors and at the fellow, you know, hometown people. And he says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And so he sits down and he's speaking with authority. So Jesus sat down and then it says this, and his disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. So you will find that, yes, there's crowds, but also you'll find him pulling in the disciples. We know that he's at least called four uh, at this time, but we don't know if there's the full 12 that are called in place. But the idea is that this is the, the idea of disciples here are those who are beginning to hear the message and those who are beginning to believe and they're following after him. And what he does is he pulls them in closer. So it's very possible that while he's seated there on this mountain, that he's got the closest followers, disciples, that are with him. But in addition to that, there's also crowds. And there will be men and there will be women. There will be children. They are our youth that are there. So this, this is the context Jesus begins to teach them. Now, before we head into the blessings, I want to go and, and give you the very last teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, the grand conclusion. Because it's important that we understand where he's heading so that we listen with this understanding. Jesus closes out in Luke chapter 7, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So Jesus is saying, listen, you look back. You've heard the words that I have said in this uh, message here on this hillside. And as I have taught this, now here's what you need to do. Anyone, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Now let me just pause here because there's another part of the story. Most of you who are listening already know this. But as you look at this context, I clearly just want you to understand that as we look at this Sermon on the Mount where God is calling us to live very differently. In fact, it's living upside down compared to how the rest of the world lives. These are the words of Jesus. And what he says is this. Now, 
not only do you need to listen to it, but now if you'll really hear it, and if you will put it into practice, then you are like the wise individual, and you build your house on strong foundation, for this is what God's kingdom is. This is where he rules and reigns. Uh, this is what it is to be a genuine follower, where he has his way within your life. And yes, the rain comes down, and yes, the streams rise, and winds blow, and they beat against that house. But the house does not fall because its foundation was on the rock. And then Jesus gives the contrast. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. It was faster, it was easier. But the rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. By the way, not just disciples. But there were the others who heard as well. We're not exactly for sure how it took place. Most likely he's got in this place where it's almost like an amphitheater. And the disciples are the closest and they hear, but others hear as well. And they're amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So what Matthew is saying is in this <clears throat> beginning of his gospel, in the first body of the full public, anyway, this, this public teaching of Jesus, this is the longest of, of the discourses that you will find in all of the Gospels, a time when Jesus sits down and teaches. But uh, what Matthew is saying is, he's saying, here's Jesus. And here's what he has to say. Here's his message. And here are his actions. Now you can decide. That's what, that's what Matthew, who's a tax collector, a publican, a sinner, and yet he was called to follow after Jesus and become one of his disciples. And so he's laying it out, these words of Jesus, laying this out. This is what Jesus has to say. This is what the kingdom of God is like. Not just religion, but this is what it's like when God reigns and he has his way in your life. And he also basically is saying that these are the words of Jesus and what Jesus is saying. This is the kingdom. And will you follow me in, in my leadership of your life? back into the will and to the ways of God. Will you follow me? So uh, I want you just to kind of let that take, take a, a breather for a moment. And I want you to understand that as we head into this Sermon on the Mount, this, this is what is at stake. Either wisdom or foolishness, either life or death, either God rules and reigns within our lives and we take him seriously and we live like this, even though the bar is high and we say, God, you're gonna to have to empower me by the spirit to not only hear it, but to go ahead and then translate this and these words into how I live out my life in relationship with God and how I live out my life in relationship with people, how I live the days of my life in this world. And either you'll be wise or you'll be a fool. Either you'll follow after life or, 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 or it'll lead to, to death and loss. But uh, God has a great way for us. And he wants to really, that his kingdom would come in our lives. So here we go. I want you to follow along. We're going to read the first 16 verses and then we're going to hit four blessings. Are you ready? One day as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside. He sat down and his disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor in spirit and realize their need for him for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice righteousness, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those who, uh, whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because of my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad. For a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is it if salt, uh, what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp 
<clears throat> and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Let's hit four blessings. Before we do, what does this mean to be blessed? What is this, the blessed life? The truth is the idea is much greater than just uh, some that would translate it. Uh, happy is the person, happy is the man who. Um, I've, uh, anyway, one of the authors, was it Robert Schuller, the be happy attitudes. Um, it's more than just be happy. It is, it is, it is much uh, deeper than that. The idea is that there has been approval that comes from God. It means to be approved. But with it is a sense of <clears throat> that as God's blessing rests upon us and uh, there's blessing that rests in, in, as we are uh, poor in spirit, the first one here. But the idea is that there's a sense of wholeness, of contentment, yes, happy, but it also has the idea of being fulfilled and settled and just complete. There is no higher blessing than to be approved by God. And uh, so the idea is that people who live as this, this is the way of blessing and favor. All right, so let's start with this first blessing. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, what is poverty of spirit? What exactly is that? You'll find a couple of verses out of Isaiah that help really kind of shape God's attitude toward us. Uh, when we approach him in uh, strong humility. For this is what the high and exalted one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but I also live um, with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Uh, so the idea is that our approach toward God, we are broken we are poor in spirit. We are really spiritually bankrupt. Uh, Isaiah 66 verse 2 says, These are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. Boy, that is a great one to go ahead and memorize and learn. There is, a, there, there is an idea with uh, this of poverty in spirit that... Uh, uh, anyway, it's a personal acknowledgement of spiritual bankruptcy. It's coming to God and there's this conscious confession that we are unworthy before God. And as a result, it is the deepest form of repentance. Um, I, I, you know, that old, uh, the old hymn, George Beverly Shea at the Billy Graham Crusades uh, would sing, just as I am without one plea. In other words, I, I have got nothing to bring, Lord. There is nothing good in me. There's nothing that I have to offer to you. I just need your, your mercy. Uh, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come. I come. The approach to God is, uh, <clears throat> I don't have a thing to bring to you, God. Spiritual bankruptcy. And this is a conscious confession that we are unworthy. Okay, so this is a concept. I don't like this word. And I'm going to guess you don't like this word either, but there's this strong, strong um, sense of this word when we truly are poor in spirit. And it's the idea of neediness. Uh, who likes to be needy? You've been around needy people before. Oh, <clears throat> no matter what you do, it's just you can't quite satisfy that longing and that, that needy. But I will tell you this, that God is not put off by our neediness. In fact, we don't really enter into his rule and reign at all unless we come to him in as needy to him. Um, and just say, I, uh, I just need you, God. I can't, I, I, I can't live this Jesus life. I, I've got to have you. I've got to have your ways. I, I have messed up my life. All those kinds of things. It's, it's just understanding. I'm bankrupt. I have nothing to bargain with you about. Poor in spirit. Jesus tells that, that powerful story in Luke chapter 18. It starts in verse 9, where he tells the story uh, to someone who had great confidence in his own righteousness and scorned everyone else. <laughs> That's the setting for this story. He tells this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and they scorned everyone else. In other words, they were absolutely convinced of their superiority. And so he talks about two men who go into the temple to pray, and one is a Pharisee. 
and one is a despised tax collector, and the Pharisee st stands by himself, and he comes boldly, and he prays this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly like, not like that tax collector, and he points to the guy behind him. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. In other words, he comes and he approaches God with how good he is and all that he has to offer God. And then there's the tax collector, and he stood at a distance. Do you see the guy? He stands at a distance. This is an artist's rendering of, you know, the, the tax collector. Stands at a distance, dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed, and instead he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. By the way, the longer I live, the more I love that prayer. Uh, I think it's probably the only prayer that uh, we really have to offer to God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I think if anything, that is the one statement that is the closest thing to the sinner's prayer that will get you entrance into the kingdom of God. Because it's not just the words, it's the approach. Jesus said, I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified, made right, in just standing before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Poverty of spirit is not a man's confession that he is insignificant or personally without value. Such would be untrue. It is rather a confession that he is sinful and rebellious and utterly without moral virtues adequate to commend himself to God. It is a foundational confession of our need of God, a humble admission of powerlessness without him. So this is a strong warning. Jesus starts right away. And it's a strong warning to the religious. So I'm speaking, you chances are you're religious. It's why you're why you're watching this. This one's for you. This one's for me. For you see, pride based on what would be genuine virtues. The Pharisee that stood, and when he said these things, when he said, Hey, I'm not fooling around, I'm not cheating on my wife, I'm not. I'm not swindling people out of money. I'm not violating the law, and I thank you, God, that I'm not like that. But uh, those were genuine virtues, but in many ways they have the greatest potential for self-deception. God will not have none of it. He insists on a full and honest, factual, conscious recognition of our personal moral bankruptcy. Now, this is the good news, that with this blessing, there's this understanding, and this is how this first blessing, beatitude, uh, winds up. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In these eight beatitudes that we're going to be looking at, we've got two weeks to do it, but uh, when it says, these lowly people, these poor in spirit, by the way, another, uh, you'll find this interchangeable, the idea of lowly individuals. They come humbly before God. They're, they're, they've stooped low before God. Of these lowly people, the poor in spirit, Jesus says theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We should understand this in the sense of, cons uh, in the sense of consequence rather than reward. So in other words, they're not being rewarded because they're poor in spirit, but this is just the overflow and the, and the consequence of that kind of humbling yourself before God. In no sense do they merit the kingdom. But being what they are, they possess it. In other words, because they're poor in spirit, uh, God comes and God takes up his residence. He rules. He reigns. Uh, we should understand uh, this in that sense of theirs alone is the kingdom of heaven. Those who are not poor in spirit can never have membership in the kingdom. This is where it starts. In this basic sense, of course, the kingdom belongs to God, and it's often said to be His. But in another sense, membership in the kingdom belongs to all the people of God, those who have come to Him and have confessed their neediness and uh, their lack, and that they are completely bankrupt spiritually. And uh, it's only the goodness and the wealth of God that can come and, and fill them up and enrich their life. And God says, oh, listen, the kingdom, kingdom of heaven, God's reign belongs to these individuals. Okay, here we go. Got three more blessings. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This verse follows naturally from the one which precedes it. Mournfulness is the emotional counterpart to poverty of spirit. 
Now, uh, the world in which we live loves to make us laugh. The pursuit of pleasure is uh, all over. Our wealthy self absorbed society. We like to have a good time. We often uh, have um, the immediate goal is the next high that we're searching after. The world does not like mourners. Mourners are wet blankets. They are absolutely no fun. But Jesus said, oh, this is the blessed life. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This mourning is a personal grief over personal sin. They've taken it personally, and they've approached God, and there's a mourning over personal sin. Genuine remorse. It is experienced by a person who begins to recognize the darkness of sin as the purity of God is realized. Most people don't live like this. But um, when we start seeing the holiness of God, and uh, how pure and perfect he is. And then we take a look at ourselves and um, we, we begin to see the awfulness, the ugliness of our sin. And I don't think we think about that enough, the, the, that sin really is ugly. We make excuses for it. We uh, respond and say, well, everybody lives like this. Our standard is lowered because we just compare ourselves to the rest of the world. But uh, there's this sense of we mourn because we've seen ourselves in, in the light of, uh, of God. Uh, Isaiah is the one that cries out after he has had a revelation of the, of the holiness of God, highly exalted. And there's been this holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And he hears this in heaven's throne room. And he responds and says, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the king the Lord Almighty. And by the way, this is the sense that the Apostle Paul also had when he looked at uh, his inability of, of how much he wanted to go ahead and do the right thing and honor God and follow, but how, how, uh, how short he fell and, uh, and what he responded with and says, what a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from the body of death? And uh, he doesn't end in the hopelessness of that verse. He heads into, but thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has come to give us a victory, but oh, what a wretched man I am in and of myself. And this has to do with the mourning, uh, the mourning that we have uh, in, uh, in, as, as we come before God. Uh, there's also a mourning that emerges from our lives just due to the sin that we observe in the world. Um, following after Jesus isn't always, I'm happy, happy, happy every single day. There's times that we look at the challenges of the world, and some of you right now are uh, witnessing things that are taking place in our nation, uh, things that are said, things that are done, um, and you look around and uh, you're disheartened. And in some ways, this is uh, the kind of mourning that takes place. Um, we, we see what is obvious. It's sin. Sinners don't see it. They don't. They. they when when sinners lash out and when they hate and uh, when in anger they lash out at other individuals and and when they mock holiness and when they head off into uh, sin and adultery and just um, just living that is immoral living, um, they, they think nothing of it because they have they have no other bar but uh, there's an, a morning that that emerges from our lives um, in our lives because of the sin that we observe in the rest of the world the sin and the wrongs of the world pile upon our consciousness and it causes us to uh, to weep it causes us to groan before God um, it is deeply offensive but uh, there is a deep sorrow deep sorrow um, deep sorrow. In our mourning, we are promised by Jesus. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. In our mourning, we will be comforted. And this comfort is not merely a relief and a soothing of the pains of our soul, although God will come and comfort us like that. But the promise comes because God sends his spirit to us. And even in the words that are being used here of comfort, it speaks of paraclete. The idea is that the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the advocate that we have with the Father, the Spirit of God is given to us. When we don't know what to say, when we don't know, there are groans that come from the Holy Spirit and there are spiritual words that can flow from us up to the Father. 
and it gives us the ability to uh, communicate with God in a uh, language of, uh, of power, but also language of deep, deep sorrow. And uh, God promises this, when, when you face your sin, um, He wants you to mourn over your sin, but uh, He also wants you to, to give you the hope and the comfort and the peace that is ours in Christ and fill you up with His Spirit that will counter uh, the great mourning and turn your mourning into seasons of great rejoicing. Here's number three. The blessed life. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Uh, we get this kind of a notion sometimes. Um, anyway, but in this notion, sometimes we get the image of weakness. Uh, I'm showing my age. Uh, these are the back of the Boys Life magazine. It will say that you've got the 97-pound weakling, and the bully says, listen here, I'll smash your face in. Only you're so skinny, you might dry up and blow away. But Charles Atlas, he will show you. He's the man's, the perfect man, perfectly formed man. And he will show you how to no longer be a 97 pound weekly. We think of meekness like this. Uh, but meekness is a controlled desire. It is strength, but it's under control. It doesn't lash out at individuals, but there's this deep sense that for the well being of others where. Um, meekness sees the interests of others and desires them to advance ahead of one's own. That's meekness. In other words, instead of bullying and demanding our way, there's this deep sense of I long for others and those around me to prosper. Um, and they use their strength to go ahead and do that. Um, love this. Jesus, Jesus said, blessed, uh, blessed are the meek. Let's go back to that. Blessed are the meek. They're going to inherit the earth. Um, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones again, the man who is truly meek is the one who is amazed that God and man can think of him as well as they do and treat him as well as they do. In other words, when individuals come with respect, because they see the strength that's inside of us, and with that strength many times it's the idea of there will be restraint for the good and the well-being of others. And then the meek individual is just kind of amazed that uh, there would be any kind of blessing or favor that would be uh, come their way. We are to leave everything, ourselves, our rights, our cause, our whole future in the hands of God, and especially so if we feel we are suffering unjustly. The idea is that I will suffer, and if it's unjustly, uh, we'll suffer unjustly, but uh, there's a patience and a strength, and we leave it in the hands of God instead of trying to push our way and fix it our way, uh, we have a, a strong submission to God. Um, Jesus used these words, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for his uh, soul? Uh, the idea is that so much of the world tells us to um, we are the center of the universe, and as a result, we relate poorly to billions of the other people who also are laboring under the very same delusion. In fact, the world will tell us, uh, you take care of yourself. Materialism will tell us, you grab what you can, and you do it while you can. Uh, but Jesus would say, listen, if you go ahead and get over yourself, and if you lose your life, and you lay that down, uh, when you begin to do that, when you do that, that's when you're really going to find what life is like. Because what good is it to go ahead and, and uh, try to exert your force and try to gain the whole world, and yet you get to the end of it and there's just really nothing to it. You forfeit your own soul. What can you give in exchange for your soul? But what Jesus promises is this, that the meek shall inherit the earth. Now, these are words that are cited actually from Psalm 37, verse 11, and it constitutes a devastating contradiction to the philosophical materialism that is so prevalent in our day and our culture. The genuine meek individual will find contentment and be content. His or her ego is not so inflated that he thinks he must always have more besides in Christ the meek understands, the already sees himself as having everything, possessing it all. Why? <laughs> because of, uh, because of uh, Jesus and all of his goodness. Hey, let's look at one more. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Uh, they will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. 
This one also is a little bit of an unpopular notion, often perceived as old school prudishness or narrow mindedness. It's not popular even to professing Christians this day. We chase happiness, we chase spiritual power, we chase all kinds of experiences. We follow after popular ones, speakers, preachers, their persuasive personas. But how many actually hunger and thirst for righteousness? But when the king comes and moves in with his kingdom, you cannot live your life without righteousness. It is as important as food and drink, if not more so. The norms of God's kingdom require that Jesus' followers are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Now, what is righteousness? Well, if you look at Paul's writings, so much of what he speaks of as righteousness, it's, he will say, not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law. Uh, Paul would say that righteousness is reckoned to us through Christ as our sins are reckoned upon Jesus and he bears our sins and he defeats our sins through his sacrificial death, but then his righteousness is reckoned to us. And there's truth to that. But when you really look at righteousness in Matthew's writings, you will find this uh, term used differently. To this gospel writer, writer, righteousness means a pattern of life that's in conformity to God's will. So the idea is that if we long for God's will to be done within our lives and we hunger and thirst after that kind of being right before God, what does it look like to be right in the sight of God? What is the right thing to do? What is the right thing to say? What does God desire from us? What's his will? What's his way? Those are the questions. You see, the person who hungers and thirsts for righteousness then craves conformity to God and to his ways. They really want to be like Jesus. It's like that old book that asks, you know, you had these people in town that would say, well, what if we just ask the question, what would Jesus do? WWJD, what, what would Jesus do? This is the idea of that, 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 that sense of righteousness. Uh, the Apostle Paul used these powerful words in Philippians chapter 3, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now, not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. So, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward, in Christ Jesus. So the idea is that we are hungry, we are thirsty, and God will come and he will fill us with his righteousness. But this is a hunger and thirst that becomes perpetual within our lives, just as the poverty of spirit is something that is, is really lived out on a regular basis within our lives. You know, you need him today. You need him today. You need him more than, than you need a health checkup. You need him more than you need some weight loss. You need him more than you need a little bit of education. You just, you, we, we're in desperate need of God. And just as this poverty of spirit, and then when we mourn over our sin, and in, in meekness when, yes, we approach God, but we, we, we approach our relationships with other, other individuals, but also that we hunger and thirst for righteousness, and the more that he fills us up, the more we become hungry and thirsty for him. For those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. This is the, this is the blessed life. The blessing is the filling. The context demands that we understand the blessing to mean uh, when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you're blessed, for you will be filled with righteousness. Uh, I remember a season of time where God asked me so much in the early years of uh, pastoring here at Life Christian Fellowship, so what do you want? And what God was constantly doing was, what are you hungry and thirsty for? What do you long for? And uh, he was weighing my heart of, of what I longed for from him. And God does that on the issue. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Oh, you do. You will be filled. Uh, the Lord gives to the famished person the desires of his heart. Okay, so let's wrap things up. We're kind of in a cra crazy generation. Uh, 
We have people that just want to be fake famous. Uh, it's all about them. Jesus, uh, Jesus gives a real different picture than this. And by the way, that's not just the world out there, but the truth is we're in a modern day of Christianity that we have our own celebrities. Um, in the years that I've been in ministry, uh, the church has not been without its scandals. So from uh, Jim and Tammy Baker to Jimmy Swaggart, back in the 80s, and Ted Haggard, and I don't know what that would be, the late 90s, no, past the year 2000, but in the early part of uh, this millennium. And the latest things that have hit the fan are uh, Carl Lenz and uh, Ravi Zacharias. Uh, how sad, how tragic. We're just in many ways. Um, and I want you to be careful that you just don't point fingers and that I don't point fingers at the ones that uh, are in the scandals that are deeply public because the issue of um, this craving that we have for the spotlight, uh, this is very different than what Jesus is calling for from our lives. He says, listen, that's not what the kingdom's like. And by the way, this is never to put down large churches and arenas that are filled with individuals, but it has to do with this. You better make sure and be careful, every single one of us. We need God to evaluate our lives. We need to head to these words of the Sermon on the Mount. And we need to ask ourselves the question of, um, is our Christianity just a public image? Or privately, is there something that is of deep, deep substance that will carry us uh, through these difficult and challenging times. You're going to hear these words in the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Instead, he calls for us. Oh, you will be blessed. I will approve. I approve. Um, but you will know happy, content, whole. You'll know this wholeness of my kingdom as you approach me in spiritual bankruptcy, poor in spirit, as you come and mourn and uh, grieve over your sin. And as you come before me with meekness and that you relate to other individuals in meekness rather than you life having to be in the spotlight with, with public image. And uh, before you ever just put out the public persona with your life, the question is that when you turn off this message, if you're still watching, will you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Or have you just done your duty to go ahead and uh, get it off your checklist to be the good Christian? But will you pick up Matthew 5, 6, 7? Will you embrace this over these next several weeks? Will this become part of your, uh, the very constitution of your spiritual life? The kingdom of God, His will, His ways. Um, this does not come naturally. In fact, it's really living life upside down compared to the rest of the world lives. But it's completely possible. For there's a Savior who patterned it for us, and He died to conquer your sin, and He's poured out His Holy Spirit upon us, if we will keep in step with His will and with His ways. Pray with me, would you? Father, I thank You for my brothers and sisters, the ones who have endured to the end of this message and this teaching. Bless them, I pray. Would you call us, God, as your people? Will you help us, Lord, if we have never really bent so low that we really are at a spot where we would say, God, I don't have anything to offer you. Really come to you, God, poor in spirit. And all these other points of the blessed life, but will you help us to understand that uh, it's bending low to you, and as we bend low to you, um, you're the one that lifts us up. So help us and bless us. I pray, Father, that you will take us out of our sin, that you will turn us towards you. And uh, we give you our lives, we pray, over these next several weeks as we look at the words of Jesus, that we would hear them. We would put them into practice. So uh, we do not uh, violate the very call that Jesus gives us. Um, that we do not drift toward foolishness, but instead that we have the wisdom to heed, to, uh, to obey. So bless us, we pray. Sustain us. In Jesus' name, amen. For those of you who aren't with us in public service yet, uh, physically, I uh, miss you desperately. 
we're anxious for the time where we can all gather in. Um, yeah, but love you very much. And so stay faithful, stay steady. Uh, the journey isn't always easy, but uh, there's great reward. You may not have already obtained it. Apostle Paul knew that. But just continue to press on. There's great reward in front of you. Hey, God bless. Have an awesome, awesome week. There's a grace when the heart is on to fight Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Another in the waters Holding back the sea Should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire
could you be to me? I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I can see, but I can see the light In the darkness, as the darkness passed to him I can hear the roar in the heavens As the space